Debbie and I'd like to thank you once again for joining us. Today we are starting chapter five of A Wrinkle in Time. I'm gonna go ahead and turn to the right page. I'm so excited because the title of this chapter is The Tesseract. You ready, Shelby? Let's get started. Yes, Mrs. Witch said, he is behind the darkness so that even we cannot see him. Meg began to cry, to sob aloud. Through her tears, she could see Charles Wallace standing there, very small, very white. Calvin put his arms around her, but she shuddered and broke away, sobbing wildly. Then she was enfolded in the great wings of Mrs. Wetsit, and she felt comfort and strength pouring through her. Mrs. Wetsit was not speaking aloud, and yet through the wings, Meg understood words. My child, do not despair. Do you think we would have brought you here if there were no hope? We are asking you to do a difficult thing, but we are confident that you can do it. Your father needs help. He needs courage. And for his children, he may be able to do what he cannot do for himself. Now, Mrs. Witch said, are we ready? Where are we going? Calvin asked. Again, Meg felt an actual physical tingling of fear as Mrs. Witch spoke. We must go beyond the shadow. But we will not do it all at once, Mrs. Wetsit comforted them. We will do it in short stages. She looked at Meg. Now we will test her. We will wrinkle again. Do you understand? No, Meg said flatly. Mrs. Wetsit sighed. Explanations are not easy when they are about things for which your civilization still has no words. Calvin talked about traveling at the speed of light. You understand that, little Meg? Yes, Meg nodded. That, of course, is the impractical long way around. We have learned to take shortcuts wherever possible. Sort of like in math, Meg asked. Like in math, Mrs. Wetsit looked over at Mrs. Who. Take your skirt and show them. La experiencia es la madre de la ciencia. Spanish, my dears, Cervantes. Experience is the mother of knowledge. Mrs. Hu took a portion of her white robe in her hands and held it tight. You see, Mrs. What's it said? If a very small insect were to move from the section of skirt in Mrs. Hu's right hand to that in her left, it would be quite a long walk for him if he had to walk straight across. I'm gonna go ahead and show you the picture that I have in my book, just in case you don't have a book in front of you. This is the one that's in my book. Swiftly, Mrs. Who brought her hands, still holding the skirt together. Now, you see, Mrs. What's It said, he would be there without that long trip. That is how we travel. So then it's showing the other picture down below. Charles Wallace accepted the explanation serenely. Even Calvin did not seem perturbed. Oh dear, Meg sighed. I guess I am a moron. I just don't get it. That is because you think of space only in three dimensions. Mrs. What's it told her. We travel in the fifth dimension. This is something you can understand, Meg. Don't be afraid to try. Was your mother able to explain a tesseract to you? Well, she never did, Meg said. She got so upset about it. Why, Mrs. What's it? She said it had something to do with her and father. It was a concept they were playing with, Mrs. What's it said, going beyond the fourth dimension to the fifth. Did your mother explain it to you, Charles? Well, yes, Charles looked a little embarrassed. Please don't be hurt, Meg. I just kept at her while you were at school till I got it out of her. Meg sighed. Just explain it to me. Okay, Charles said. What is the first dimension? Well, a line. Okay, 
And the second dimension, well, you'd square the line. A flat square would be in the second dimension. And the third, well, you'd square the second dimension. Then the square wouldn't be flat anymore. It would have a bottom and sides and a top. Okay, so this is beginning it over here. The line you can see, and you can see the flat box. So let's go to the next page. And then they're showing a box with some dimensions, I believe. That's the way they explain that. It would be a bottom and sides and a top. It wouldn't be flat anymore. Let me show that to you again. Okay. And the fourth, well, I guess if you want to put it into mathematical terms, you'd square the square, but you can't take a pencil and draw it the way you can the first three. I know it's got something to do with Einstein and time. I guess maybe you could call the fourth dimension time. That's right, Charles said. Good girl. Okay, then for the fifth dimension, you'd square the fourth, wouldn't you? I guess so. Well, the fifth dimension's a tesseract. You add that to the other four dimensions and you can travel through space without having to go the long way around. In other words, to put it into Euclid or old fashioned plane geometry, a straight line is not the shortest distance between two points. For a brief illuminating second, Meg's face had the listening probing expression that was so often seen on Charles's. I see, she cried, I got it. For just a moment, I got it. I can't possibly explain it now, but there, for a second, I saw it. She turned excitedly to Calvin. Did you get it? He nodded. Enough. I don't understand it the way Charles Wallace does, but enough to get the idea. So now we go, Mrs. Witch said. There is not all the time in the world. Could we hold hands, Meg asked. Calvin took her hand and held it tightly in his. You can try, Mrs. What's It said, though I'm not sure how it will look. I'm sorry, how it will work. You see, though we travel together, we travel alone. We will go first and take you afterward in the backwash. That may be easier for you. As she spoke, the great white body began to waver, the wings to dissolve into mist. Mrs. Who seemed to evaporate until there was nothing but the glasses, and then the glasses, too, disappeared. It reminded Meg of the Cheshire Cat. Do you know where the Cheshire Cat comes from? It comes from another story um, called Alice in Wonderland. If that sounds familiar, do you remember that or seeing that when you were younger? And maybe you can remember how the cat came into existence and faded. I've often seen a face without glasses, she thought, but glasses without a face? I wonder if I go that way too. First, me, and then my glasses. She looked over at Mrs. Witch. Mrs. Witch was there, and then she wasn't. There was a gust of wind and a great thrust and a sharp shattering as she was shoved, shoved through. What? The darkness, silence, nothingness. If Calvin was still holding her hand, she could not feel it. But this time, she was prepared for the sudden and complete dissolution of her body. When she felt the tingling coming back to her fingertips, she knew that this journey was almost over. And she could feel again the pressure of Calvin's hand about hers. Without warning, coming as a complete and unexpected shock, she felt a pressure she had never imagined, as though she were being completely flattened out by an enormous steamroller. This was far worse than the nothingness had been. While she was nothing, there was no need to breathe, but now her lungs were squeezed together so that although she was dying for want of air, there was no way for her lungs to expand and contract to take in the air that she must have to stay alive. This was completely different from the thinning of atmosphere when they flew up the mountain and she had had to put the flowers to her face to breathe. She tried to gasp, but a paper doll can't gasp. She thought she was trying to think, but her flattened out mind was as unable to function as her lungs. 
Her thoughts were squashed along with the rest of her. Her heart tried to beat. It gave a knife-like sideways, sideways, sorry, sideways movement, but it could not expand. But then she seemed to hear a voice, or if not a voice, at least words, words flattened out like printed words on paper. Oh no, we can't stop here. This is a two-dimensional planet and the children can't manage here. She was whizzed into nothingness again and nothingness was wonderful. She did not mind that she could not feel Calvin's hand, that she could not see or feel or be. The relief from the intolerable pressure was all she needed. So I'd like for you to think about the word intolerable. Uh, try to use context clues, try to use the situation, um, the other information that's been given to you, the tone, to think about what that word means. Okay, if you're thinking the word might mean something unable to endure, you're right. Let's continue. Then the tingling began to come back to her fingers, her toes. She could feel Calvin holding her tightly. Her heart beat regularly. Blood coursed through her veins. Whatever had happened, whatever mistake had been made, it was over now. She thought she heard Charles's, Charles Wallace saying his words round and full as spoken words ought to be. Really, Mrs. Witch, you might have killed us. This time, she was pushed out of the frightening fifth dimension with a sudden, immediate jerk. There she was, herself again, standing with Calvin beside her, holding onto her hand for dear life, and Charles Wallace in front of her, looking indignant. Mrs. What's It, Mrs. Who, and Mrs. Which were not visible, but she knew that they were there. The fact of their presence was strong about her. Children, I apologize, came Mrs. Witch's voice. Now, Charles, calm down, Mrs. What's It said, appearing not as the great and beautiful beast she had been when they last saw her, but in her familiar wild garb of shawls and scarves and the old tramp's coat and hat. You know how difficult it is for her to materialize. If you are not substantial yourself, it's very difficult to realize how limiting protoplasm is. Okay, words such as substantial means strongly built and protoplasm is the living parts of a cell. Okay, I am sorry, Mrs. Witch's voice came again but there was no more than a hint of amusement in it. It is not funny. Charles Wallace was, gave a childish stamp of his foot. I think I misspoke when I said Mrs. Witch's voice came again, but there was more than a hint of amusement in it. It is not funny. Charles Wallace gave a childish stamp of his foot. Mrs. Who's glasses shone out and the rest of her appeared more slowly behind them. We are such stuff as dreams are made on. She smiled broadly, Prospero in the Tempest. I do like that play. You didn't do it on purpose, Charles demanded. Oh, my darling, of course not, Mrs. What's It said quickly. It was just a very understandable mistake. It's very difficult for Mrs. Witch to think in a corporeal way. She wouldn't hurt you deliberately. You know that. And it's really a very pleasant little planet and rather amusing to be flat. We always enjoy our visits there. Where are we now then, Charles Wallace demanded, and why? In Orion's belt, we have a friend here and we want you to have a look at your plan own planet. When are we going home? Meg answered anxiously. What about mother? What about the twins? They'll be terribly worried about us. When we didn't come in at bedtime, well, mother must be frantic by now. She and the twins and Fork will have been looking.